Welcome to the last distinguished lecture of the distinguished lecture series for 2017 2018. It's also the last day of the semester, so I'm sure you have exams and uh, grading exams in your mind, I guess. So it's my great privilege to introduce Dr. Bhavani Thuraisingam. Uh, she's been a great colleague, a great mentor, and really a pillar of the department who's made, uh, played an instrumental role in making the department a success. So Dr. Bhavani Thuraisingam is a is the Louis A. Beecher Jr. Distinguished Professor in the Eric Johnson School of Engineering and Computer Science over here. She's also the Executive Director of UTD Cybersecurity Research and Education Institute, which actually she founded in October 2004, and it has continued since then with great success. She's also a Senior Research Fellow at King's College at the University of London for period 25, 2015 to 2018. She's also a New America Cybersecurity Policy Fellow and of course her research is in the area of cybersecurity where she's made tremendous contributions. Uh, prior to joining UTD, she worked at the MITRE Corporation for 16 years, including a three-year stint as a program director at the National Science Foundation. She initi initiated the data and application security program at NSF, so she has a long involvement with cybersecurity research. Uh, she was also a member of the Cyber Trust team over there. While at MITRE, she was a department head and was also a technical advisor to the DOD, Department of Defense, the National Security Agency, CIA, and the Internal Revenue Service. She's a recipient of numerous technical achievements awards from IEEE and ACM. Too many to list here, so she can, you can read her bio in detail. She's also a recipient of the 2013 IBM Faculty Award and also Dallas Business Journal 2017 Women in Technology Award. Uh, she's a 2003 Fellow of the IEEE. Uh, and AAAS, which is American Association, Association for Advancement of Science, and a 2000 fellow of the British Computer Society. She has published many, many papers, 120 journal articles, 250 conference papers, 15 books, quite an achievement, and she has delivered over 130 keynotes and featured addresses, and she also holds uh, six US patents. She has chaired, co-chaired top-tier conferences, including the Women in Cybersecurity Conference in 2016, the ACM's CCS conference in 2017. She's going to serve as the program co-chair for the IEEE International Conference on Data Management in 2018. She got her PhD from the University of Wales, Swansea, UK, and she earned a higher doctorate called the Doctor of Engineering from the University of Bristol, England, for her published research in secure data management. So ladies, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Kamani. Thank you. I would like to thank Dean Porras for inviting me to give this uh, lecture, and it's really a great honor. I would also like to thank uh, our department head, Professor Gopal Gupta, uh, for all his support, and all uh, members of our team, both professors, students, and many of you are here. So my talk is going to be secure data management foundations, systems, and applications. It's sort of my journey since 1985. So the dean asked me to give a talk both technical as well as motivational, which is something that I've tried to do in this presentation. Before I start, I want to give a brief background about myself. Not technical background, which of course Dr. Gupta has talked about, more or less more of a personal background, how I got here. I am of Sri Lankan Tamil origin. I got married in 1975 when I was 20. I got my, while I was finishing my BSc, which is a Bachelor, Bachelor of Science degree in Mathematics and Physics. And at that time, my husband, also of Tamil origin, was finishing his PhD at University of Cambridge. So after we married, I followed my husband to the University of Bristol, where he had a job as a postdoctoral fellow. And I started my graduate education. And I got a PhD in theory of computation. And then we moved to the United States in 1980 to Socorro, New Mexico, where my husband got a job at New Mexico Tech at the Petroleum Recovery Research Center as a research scientist. And I went to visit the computer science department. Just during the first visit, he said, we'll offer you a tenure track assistant professor faculty position at New Mexico Tech. 
So I hadn't expected that. You know, I was 25 years old, my son was a baby. So I thought about it and I told him, uh, uh, no, thank you. And I would like a visiting faculty position. Now, when you do that, it, as I said in one of my earlier talks at the Women in Data Science, it becomes a lot harder, right, to establish your career. So for the next five years, three of which I was a visiting faculty at New Mexico Tech, and then my husband wanted to get into industry, so he got a very good position at 3M uh, in Minnesota, so I joined as a visiting faculty at the University of Minnesota in mathematics and also in computer science. And then I wanted to, I really got very interested in development, so I joined Control Data Corporation. It was a huge computer company, number three company at the time, and most of my students haven't even heard of the company. So I worked there in development for two, just over two years. And uh, it, it was really fun, but I was not really doing much research. I was doing research in theory of computation on my own time, uh, also as an adjunct faculty at University of Minnesota. So uh, I waited for the right time. So we were working on the first distributed system com uh, computer network uh, product called CDCNet. So we had the release. And just as we released, uh, I wanted to sort of get into more, uh, get into research. So it was tough, but I was very, very lucky. I got a lucky break in 1985 fall. What happened? I became a U. I had to become a U.S. citizen, which is what happened uh, in the fall of 85. And Honeywell got a had to get a contract from uh, the U.S. Air Force, and uh, they had to interview me, and they had to hire me. So all three things happened at the same time. And so the likelihood of that happening, I don't know, you can calculate the probability, which I haven't. So that sort of really propelled my career because we designed the first secure data management system for the Air Force while I was at Honeywell. So I've been working in cybersecurity and data science at Honeywell, MITRE, NSF, UT Dallas for the last 32 plus years, almost 33 years this fall. Okay, so if I have to talk about everything what I've done, then we'll be here till probably five, six o'clock this evening. So very briefly, what have I done in secure data management? So I started in secure relational data management, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that because that research has had a huge impact. And that work, I had a major role. I was the principal designer of the database system called Lock Data Views. And following that, starting at Honeywell, continuing into MITRE, I started working on the foundations of what is called inference aggregation privacy problems. And that research also has had a huge impact on what's happening today in data privacy. You could talk to my colleague, Murad Kantarjulu, who is now one of the top experts in data privacy, and he can hopefully vouch for it. Okay, so around that time at MITRE, you see on the left and right, and I'm not going to go into the details, I'm not going to touch that at all, some equally important work, secure distributed and object data management systems. So, we had to design a formal model, security policy formal model, and design of the system, and also do verification and then implementation. And on the right-hand side, uh, secure dependable real-time. So we were one of the early researchers to bring in real-time processing and secure data management. Okay, so that work started around 1993, and uh, I sort of finished that work in 2008 after coming to UT Dallas. So much of the work, so the first parts, uh, I did that uh, while I was at Honeywell, MITRE, and some while I was at NSF. Okay, so after coming to UT Dallas, my focus was on secure data science. So there are three aspects I'm going to discuss. One is my work, which is foundations of secure data collection and data sharing systems. When I say mine, I was the principal investigator. And then the other two pieces, data science for cybersecurity, is something I was part of my colleague, I don't know whether he's here, Professor Latifah Khan's team. 
And the third area, cybersecurity for data science. I'm part of Dr. Murad Kantaujalu's team. And then some other work, secure social media, cloud semantic web, and so on. So there's lots of interesting work, but I'm not going to discuss. So the parts in orange are the ones I'm going to talk to you about. And three of them, I'm going to go into it somewhat deep, make it technical. And the other two, the parts where I'm a technical contributor, data science for cybersecurity and cybersecurity for data science, I'll briefly touch upon it. Okay. And then end of the presentation will be sort of a motivational talk for the students. And I see also many female students, so hopefully that will be motivational for you. Okay, so, so I joined Honeywell, and my first task was to design a multi-level secure data management system. And we called it Lock Data View. So Honeywell was designing something called a lock operating system. What was unique about this lock operating system is that it had, it was, it was based on a model called the non-interference model. Until then, so we are talking about mid to late 80s. So lock was being designed in the early to mid 1980s. Until then, many of the secure systems were designed using a model called Bella Fadula model. The lock operating system, it was very unique. And some of the key points of that system, how do you subset the trusted computing base, is being used today in the design of secure systems. So lock was based on something that was called the non-interference property where levels don't mix. So things that happen at a higher level does not impact anything that happens at a lower level. So remember, we are talking about the 80s, still Cold War. So what we were really concerned about was to make sure our secrets did not get into the hands of the enemies. Things have changed. I mean, that's still important about secrets. But today, in addition to the secrets, we also want to get the right information at the right time to the warfighter. OK, so the problems are much worse now. And we didn't also have any malware attacks, but we had to be very concerned about covert channels because our enemies were attacking and surreptitiously getting information. So what did we do? Sorry. OK, so, so restricts the subjects that are allowed to execute in this domain. So what lock data views is all about is built on top of lock. It restricts how these various subjects, processes, can execute. And what is really important here is this notion called assured pipelines. So we have what is called pipelines. Think of it as pipes, right, tubes, where we formally verify using mathematical proofs and first order logic proofs that when the data goes from one end to another, right, that it is not bypassed. And that was formally verified in some of our papers. So that and I'm going to show you later in the next chart. So lock type enforcement mechanism was a great way to host database systems as assured pipelines. OK? So we have to prove that the pipelines are both unbypassable and tamper-proof. And it's not just that we can say, OK, we approve, because there is the big judge that is there to test, to see, have we done the right thing? And who is the big judge? The National Security Agency and the National Computer Security Center. OK, so some of the work that we have done, and I've listed papers, and this is going to go on the website. So please feel free to you know, read the papers and also send comments. Uh, is to design a multi-level data model because users at different levels see different data, right? At the top secret level, you can see some data. At the unclassified level, you can see something else. But that also poses a challenge because I think, sorry, this, this scarf is, is, is it, can we do something else with this? Is it okay? Okay. So, so what happens here is that you have a multi-level data model, different views at different levels. But 
Remember, relational databases, and those of you who have taken databases, is based on a solid theory. So we developed a multi-level database theory, which is what is given in the second paper. Okay, so design of LDV, where we designed and we discussed the theory that we have designed for multi-level database systems. And we also designed the formal security architecture. What does security architecture mean? So you look at the system architecture, and then you identify which aspects of the system architecture are security critical. So when we do the design, and we want to minimize it, because if everything, we are, on the one hand, we can say the whole database system is security critical. But that, wouldn't, that would defeat the entire purpose, because we've got to formally verify. And that depends on the level of assurance, because we were designing something called an A1 system, the highest level of assurance, which means we had to design, have formal verification. And one of the reasons Honeywell wanted me for the project was because I had a formal a mathematical logic and a formal verification background at the time. OK, so technology, huge success story was that our technology was transferred. And this is not just lip service, because it is documented. Uh, to commercial products at that time, Oracle, Sybase, Informix, Ingress. We didn't have Microsoft, SQL Server, IBM, and so on. So these were the four major products. But one, in addition to this design, one of the things that I really started at that time, and many people attribute this to me, is this whole notion of inference. And I'm going to come back to that. OK, so. Uh, what are these pipelines? Remember, I talked about these pipelines. So in terms of these pipelines, we designed three pipelines. And then I also implemented these pipelines. So what happens in these pipelines? Database operations are queries, updates, and metadata management. Of course, there are several other database operations. But at that time, we focused on three operations. One was the query operation, so we designed the entire operation as a pipeline. And we had the database request, the parser, the user request manager. Modify. So we had to modify the query. So if you ask me, so what's the research? A lot of research here in the modified query according to the security policies, and then formally proving that the modified query is indeed correct. And then we had a relational access manager, query strategy, and so on. So, so, this, so this is a query pipeline. And lack of time, I won't go into the details, updates, and then the metadata. Because the metadata had to be designed correctly. And then updates. So let's try to do as much work as possible during database updates, because we want this to be fast. So let's take some of the burden and put it up here. That means we want to make sure that the data is entered at the correct level, correct segment. So that was much of the research here. OK? So what the end result, in addition to transferring this to the commercial products, the National Security Agency had something called, they developed something called the Purple Book. Because we have to evaluate these systems. We can't just say, OK, my system is just like saying that you, know, you are the most beautiful person, right? We need. We need some way to evaluate. That means we have to enter beauty contests and win. So we, so we were really in competition with SRI International. And of course, it wasn't very pleasant because you know, they said theirs was better. We said ours was better. Anyway, so this was the design. Now, this is, I'm going to talk more about this and some of my fundamental work here. OK, so what I did was you have all these pipelines. But how do you implement them? And also, not just giving the right answers to the user. Everybody, the, the Department of Defense was really, not just the Department of Defense, even some other agencies were really para paranoid about not just the secrets going out, what people can do. They can infer lots of data put together and infer something that is highly classified. Okay, And at that time, and I don't want to mention countries, and we probably know which countries they are. They were excellent in doing that. Okay? They can put A, B, C, D together, and then infer something that is that's top secret. And that has happened. So what I did was to introduce something. People were talking about inference, but no one had discussed, provided a formal definition. And everyone said, it's too, it's too, too hard, too hard, too hard. So I said, OK, let me tackle this problem. So first, what I did, 
two-pronged approach. While I was designing these systems, I was also looking at the foundations. Okay, so these systems, again, these assured pipelines, what I mentioned to you, we had a secure database system, so this would be a locked data views. But see, by that time, for much of the implementation, I had gone to MITRE, so we didn't really have access to locked data views. We sort of simulated. And then I built what was called an inference controller. Inference, and this is still, I, my first thing when I came to UT Dallas was re-implement this whole thing because this was, I'm very, very passionate about this. So we had a query, update, and database design. So instead of just processing some of the policies during query, during update, during the database design, what I did was to collect all of the information and then do some analysis and reasoning. So that my initial reasoning and implementation and so on was carried out in C. Okay, this entire system was designed, implemented, and it was patented and licensed to Nathan Mirvold. He was the Microsoft CEO, Nathan Mirvold's company. Okay, so some of the policies, and I'm going to explain to you some of the policies like A and B taken together could be top secret, or once A has been released, you cannot release B. Okay, so yes, there were criticisms about this work. What people were, some, some, some loved this work. They said, we really need this. But some said, how long are you going to keep the history information, right? History can grow and grow and grow and grow. And at that time, we didn't really, we're talking about the early 90s now, we didn't really have all of the storage to put everything, right? And this took me about two years to implement the whole thing, right? Because Everything had to be tightly integrated. But the NSA R2 chief came and saw this, and that's when he made me the advisor to him for seven years to uh, strategize what the programs uh, for him to fund. So we funded a lot of efforts in this area. So some policies, queries, updates, and database design. But it's not just what we did for the pipelines. A lot more than that because we had to also reason. You put A and B you can imply C, A, B, C, you can imply D. So, and we had, you know, a number of uh, public, numerous publications in this area. Fine, so, everybody was saying, inference problem is unsolved, I mean, they didn't, they didn't know it was unsolvable, it's too hard, too hard, too hard, you can put all the stuff together. So I said, okay, let me look at how hard it is. And remember, I come from a theory of computation background. That was my PhD. So I said, OK, let me look at this problem. And then let's look at my, uh, some of my work in the theory of computation and see how I can merge the two and show formally that it's indeed unsolvable. And the National Security Agency quoted this work as the most significant work done in database security. Yeah, and this was mentioned in 1990. If you look at my website, there is a quote from the National Security Agency's uh, work, I mean, their statements. So, and that's what Dr. John Campbell, okay. So I'm gonna talk about my proofs now. Challenge post that I post in the 1990s, how can we measure security and privacy? At that time, we didn't really know how to measure. I proved it was unsolvable. I had also looked at some of the computational complexity aspects of certain classes of inference problem. But I didn't get a measure. But that question was answered by the lady. I'm sorry about this. I think we should have put this. Sorry. OK. Sorry about that. So OK. So this was answered uh, in 2002 by Professor Latanya Sweeney. And uh, Murat works with her. OK. So, what were, so what were the results that I got? So I designed, I, I developed, a, I, I defined a multi-level database very briefly. It's a quadruple BFCA. B is a database. I uh, designed something called a privacy, defined something called a privacy function. C is a recursive set of privacy policies. And A is an algorithm, that's an effective procedure which assigns privacy levels to the data based on a C. OK, so what is the privacy problem? You can call it privacy, you can call it inference. Inference problem or privacy problem. Privacy problem, again, is that 
my, the way I'm defining this problem, there are different definitions, is you can take collections of data together and infer something that is highly private or highly sensitive. So there is a function called the consequences of f from b. So you look at everything that you, you can derive from b, and if there is something there that is above the level L, because B is at level L, then a privacy problem has occurred. Now, common sense would tell you that it's impossible to deduce everything because the Turing uh, halting problem, it can go on and on and on. Fine, but unless you prove it, nobody would get convinced. So I define the privacy problem and then a couple of theorems. So Essentially, for every privacy level L, I showed that the privacy problem is recursively enumerable. And then if it's recursively enumerable, what extent to it is it recursively enumerable? Is it non-simple? If you look at the recursion theory, there are different types of uh, sets, like non-simple sets, simple sets, and so on. So the theorem two, uh, so this is the first result. The second result is there is a situation, what I mean by a situation, a particular example you can give, where PP public is not recursive. PP public is that there is, you can put public information together and infer something that is highly private. So we assume, if you assume that the privacy functions are deterministic, that means it's a deterministic function, then not sort of multiple answers, you can also show that it is not creative. Creative is the highest level of unsolvability. And there is a situation, mean some sort of instance, where PP public is neither recursive nor a cylinder. So in order to show, so the, the most fundamental result here, I mean, there are many things embedded.